so um, I've had an internal dialogue over the last couple of days, um, actually yesterday, and uh, should I preach what I had planned to preach or do something different today? And uh, I just want to tell you a conversation I had with Will, um, gosh, I don't know how many years ago. It was, well, he's, he was a young man anyway, but he was having that, I don't know what I want to do with my life sort of moment. And he was contemplating going back to college. He was contemplating uh, going into full-time Christian service. And uh, when I asked him about why he wanted to go into the ministry, one of the things that he said was, I just want people to have what I have. I want people to have a relationship with Jesus that I got. And uh, uh, Will actually was led to go into, um, going to be a math teacher and just be a servant in the church. And what an incredible servant he was. And, um, you know, I, I, guys, we need to pray for Moriarty High right now uh, because uh, 2020 has not been great for them. And um, he was a love math teacher and, and different things. But I, I came up with this that Will just wanted to help people. He was one of the greatest helpers I've ever met in my life. But he also was one that just wanted people to know Jesus more. So I think Will would have just said, just keep doing what you're going to do uh, today. Uh, and, and so I, I want to kind of dive into what it is that we were going to dive into no matter what. And with that, um, the video that we just watched kind of places a dichotomy of things together in, in that there's God over here and there is fear over here. And whether we know it or not, oftentimes our fears feel bigger than God. Now, we know that that's not a reality, but we, we feel like our, our fears are, are really big. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say fear is one of the biggest motivators in life. In fact, I, I, I say that fear is a, is a great motivator. In fact, it, it has so many different tentacles to it. But one of the realities is that our fears are often dictated in our culture today by the color of our skin. There's a divide in our country. There's a political divide and sometimes a, a racial divide. But it even happens with our fears. And sometimes white people, we fear what might happen or what people say is going to happen. People who have a little bit darker skin, they fear that what has already happened might happen again. And so we are driven by fear. And I'll even tell you, our media doesn't do us any favors in, in, in driving the, the, the fear and the hysteria of things. I'll even go as far as to say this, nothing is as big as election year Fear. We're, we're probably all aware of that, but I, I think about it that Republicans are saying if we don't stop the Democrats, then they're going to take all of our freedoms. And, and the Democrats are saying if we don't stop the Republicans, they're going to steal our social security, right? Is that, that's the fears that, that, that people have. If, if Bernie gets in, if Bernie gets in, we're going to spiral into communism. If, if Trump gets in again, he's going to become Hitler. I actually was getting ready to use a, a, an illustration about Hitler a few weeks ago, I actually Googled that illustration. And so Hitler, do you know what came up more than Hitler? Trump. Because that's the, the hysteria that, that we live in today. But here's part of this, nothing sells like fear. Uh, and in fact, I know I'm getting calls and I'm getting texts and I'm getting emails that all talk about the, the political fear right now. But it's always followed up with, and for your donation of $100, we can stop our enemy. It's, it's all about fear. And I just happen to believe that there's a better path. There is a better path than fear, even though sometimes my fears are really big, even in that political realm, even in the chaos of our society. In fact, I, I had a little uh, thing, and that's not like me, but my wife was... I was on a specific channel and it was a, they were talking politics and there were politicians talking and different things like that. And she said, what do you want to watch? 
And I said, anything but this. And she goes, no, no, what do you want to watch? I'm like, anything but this, because I could just feel the anger and the fear and everything just boiling inside of me. So it's easy to go there. But here's the reality. Here is the reality. There's a better path. I want to talk about that better path here today because God was, was working in chaos. He was working in, in the craziness of culture. In fact, the, the time of the book of Jeremiah, if you want to go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, that's where we're going to be today. But in, in the time of, uh, of Jeremiah, things were spiraling out of control, and God is getting ready to ramp up the chaos. He is getting ready to ramp up the crazy. He's getting ready to take the most of the people of Judah and Jerusalem and cart them 800 miles away. And 800 miles away would have been Babylon. So you think about that, that was a, a monumental shift, but it was crazy and it was chaotic and it was scary. But God lays out for Jeremiah something better than fear. And, and God, I, understood, I think I understood that fear is a big motivator because over 100 times in the Bible, it says, do not fear. And oftentimes it's Jesus or God speaking first person saying, do not fear. And so there is a better path, and we find this. Let's start reading in, in chapter four or chapter one, verse four. It says this: Now the word of the Lord came to me. That's Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet of the nations. Now, just to tell you that in in my life and and journey as a Christian, this passage right here has been very important for me to come up with a theology of life. And it talks about the sovereignty of God here. And in God's sovereignty, he knew Jeremiah before he was born and before he was formed and, and, and so on. So uh, I, I say the sanctity of life goes way up here. And there is that, but there's something here that's very important. As he is talking to Jeremiah, he is saying, listen, the very existence of you is for my mission. I've placed you here. I've placed you in this world. I've placed you in this moment. I have placed you in this place for a very specific purpose. Now, that helps me understand me. That helps me understand you. It helps me understand us in that God has, has created us for a very specific purpose. In fact, I'll even go as far as to say this. We exist for the mission of God. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, I'll, I will just say this. Your life is no mistake. You're more than a carbon footprint. Uh, you are, are here than more than to just pay taxes and just be in life. You are here for a very specific purpose. And that purpose is the mission of God. And I don't know what that is for you, but I know that God has a lane for you. He has a, a path for you that is meant to, to be for him and for his son, and for his son's kingdom. Now, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around all of this. And I think Jeremiah did as well, understanding that he has got a very specific, special place in the mission of God. Because as we read on in verse 6, he has this, uh, I call this, yeah, but. And have you ever have been talking with somebody and they go, yeah, but. And, and yeah, but is usually followed with an obstacle, um, a, a conflict, a controversy, or, or something that's like, this is not going to work. And then he said in, in verse 6, then I said, ah, Lord, and that's kind of his yeah, but. Ah, Lord God, behold, I, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth, I, probably late teens. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now, Jeremiah here, all he could see was how this couldn't work. He could only see obstacles where God was really focused in on mission. And I think we kind of do a, a, a lot of that where we focus in on obstacles where God is, is focused in on mission. And we say, well, this can't happen because I'm not prepared or I'm too young or I've never done this before. And, and if, you're too, uh, if you feel like you're too old, you'll say things like, you can't te teach an old dog new tricks, right? I've never done it this way where I, I, I haven't ever 
really kind of a, a absorb this information. And, and so we either think we're before our prime or we're past our prime. But the reality is we need to focus in on that God has given uh, our church, he's given every single one of us a mission in life. And we are to carry that out faithfully. One of the things that I appreciate about Jesus is Jesus faithfully carried out his mission, but he knew the why of his existence. In fact, I love uh, Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now that statement right there is Jesus knew the why of his existence. He knew that the cross was his why. And, it, and Luke says that he resolutely turned toward Jerusalem. That was his purpose in life. And one of the things that we have to understand about Jesus, this is uncomfortable time. Remember I said last week, there's gonna be times that you're not gonna be happy with me. But this is one of the things that we have to understand about Jesus. Jesus is above the kingdoms of this world. Now, one of the things that a preacher in Atlanta says is that, that, that Jesus, everybody wants a stake in him. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus, even in the political spectrum. So he said like Republicans, they'll, they'll say something like, well, we have the values of Jesus. We have the morals of Jesus. We value life. We, we value life at conception. We value the sanctity of marriage. See, we have Jesus on our side. And the Democrats will say, but no, we have Jesus on our side because we claim the, 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 the love and compassion and mercy uh, of, of Jesus. So everybody's saying they want a piece of Jesus. But I love what, what Tony Evans says about Jesus. He says, Jesus is not an American. By the way, probably not blue-eyed or blonde-haired, okay, because we want to have that, that version of Jesus. He is not Republican or Democrat. He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. I mean, that is, that's the same way we have to understand that Jesus, his kingdom is not of this world. I mean, as we are kind of in this series between two worlds, we understand that we're of Jesus' kingdom, but we have to live in this world. And one of the things that we have to understand about Jesus himself and his kingdom is that his church has grown and thrived under various political systems in its, in its entirety. I mean, it, it, it grew up and, 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 and exploded under the Roman Empire. And it's been under dictatorships and monarchies and communism and uh, parliamentary systems and republics and democracy and, and has grown in all of those and has existed in all of those because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. But listen, here's the purpose of Jesus. Here's what he wants for people in this world. He wants to bring all people under his rule and his reign in his kingdom that is bigger than any temporary political system that we have today. But if we're honest, a lot of our fears in life revolve around the political system that we exist within. A lot of our fears are, what if my guy doesn't get in? What is that going to do for me? We fear the unknown. We fear that you know, that we don't have control of everything. Jeremiah, same, same spot. He feared that he was going into an unknown and he wasn't prepared and he was too young and he couldn't talk. But yet God was one step ahead of him. One of the things we have to realize is that God is one step ahead of our obstacles. He is one step ahead of our fears. Notice what it says in verse 8, it says, he says, do not be afraid of them because he knows that, listen, we're afraid. But as we read on to verse 9, notice what it says here. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to, with, uh, and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Here's this, this interesting thing. Jeremiah was concerned that he couldn't talk well. And he says that God reached out and he touched my mouth. And, and then he says, I have put my words in your mouth. Here's the reality. And here's something that we all have to just grab a hold of here today. And it's this right here. 
God will give us everything that we need for his mission. If he calls us into something, he calls us to do something, calls us to, uh, to, to step out of our comfort zone, God, he gave Jeremiah everything. I think he will do the same thing for us. And I'll go as far as to say this. I, I want to share a story with you, and, and I don't share this story to be the hero because I know me and I'm no hero. But in 1991, I was in Alexandria, Louisiana. Anybody ever been to Alexandria, Louisiana? By the way, some of the best food on the face of the planet. And so I was in Alexandria, and I was in this little church, and I was on a singing team. That's a, that was a very safe lane for me was to sing, by the way. Not so much now. But I was on the singing team, and as I'm up there singing, one of the professors who was going to preach later um, looked at me, and he said, he mouthed my name. I could say that he was saying Brandon, and then he went like this, pray. And so my, as I'm singing, I'm doing this because I don't want to talk in public. I'll sing in public, but I don't want to talk in public. A couple months later, I was on another trip. I was actually in uh, northeast Oklahoma in uh, a little town by the name of Kansas, Oklahoma, and there was a children's home there, and they uh, had uh, 100 or so kids and people from within uh, the ministry there, and then people within the town of Kansas that I, I remember, it was an A-frame church and it had the big, you know, the, the big beams and different things like that and the high ceiling, and I had been asked by the college as we go to do the communion devotion that day. So I prepared my communion devotion. I walked up on stage. I put everything on the pulpit and I look out and there are hundreds of people. I do not remember anything after that. I don't. I, I, I don't know what I said. I, I, I don't know anything after that. I probably was a blubbering idiot, but I do remember that after the service was over, the president of the college approached me and he looked angry. And he informed me at that point in time that I embarrassed him and the college. Yay me, right? <laughs> so I, I, was, I, I was petrified and, and that did not do anything to help me with the whole idea of public speaking. Well, that summer I was in... Uh, Honubi, Oklahoma. You probably don't know where Honubi, Oklahoma is. It's in southeast Oklahoma in the Kaimishi Mountains. And I, I'm at a church camp and they asked me to do a campfire devotion. Well, I do a campfire devotion and I was so relieved that I could just get up and talk and I couldn't see the faces looking at me because it was dark. I was like, okay, this, this is better. Well, the next semester I was, it was a Friday afternoon. I never preached a sermon in church, but they, they're, they're bringing a group of guys um, from, from Dallas to Eastern New Mexico to go to some of the smaller churches and Hobbs and Lovington and different things like that. And the professor came up to me and said, listen, we need a guy to go. Uh, can you preach? And I'm like, no, never preached before in my life. And, and, and he said, well, listen, we'll, we'll help you out. We'll help you write a sermon. My roommate actually had a sermon said, here, I'll give you one of mine. Well, I, I kind of reworked it and did everything like that. Went out and preached in Artesia, New Mexico. By the way, that church is no longer there. And I think I had something to do with that. <laughs> But um, I, I preached in this church about 15 people. I, again, don't remember much of the day. The next week, I get called back into the administration office. It's, well, it's happened more than once, by the way. But um, I was pulled into the administration office, and the church had called to let the school how wonderfully I did with my sermon. And I don't, I, I'm just going to say this, that God has worked in that, and I'm still petrified to get up in front of people. I'm awkward around people. Uh, sometimes I don't even like people. <laughs> it's reality. <laughs> Yet God has put me here. And here's the thing. When God takes a weakness and makes it into somewhat of a strength, that means it's his story and his glory, and he gets the credit. And so when he calls you into an uncomfortable place and he calls you to do something that's out of your comfort zone, maybe he's wanting an opportunity to get the glory in your life. And that's exactly what happened with Jeremiah. In fact, we're not going to read on, but in verses 11 through 16, there's prophecy. In fact, there's two visions. In fact, God 
asked Jeremiah, what do you see? And he says, well, I see an almond tree. And what do you see? I, I see a boiling pot. And he sees all this. But I, I think there's prophecy here. In fact, I know there's prophecy here. But I also believe that God asked Jeremiah a question, and he was able to articulate and communicate effectively where it was God saying, listen, you can do this. I really have put my words in your mouth. I am with you. But there's a bigger story here. There's actually a, a, a much bigger story. Because we want to make this the story of Jeremiah. In fact, this is the book of Jeremiah. But the book of Jeremiah exists within the Bible, which is the story of God. And as this interchange between God and Jeremiah goes, Jeremiah speaks a little bit. God speaks a lot. And as God speaks a lot here, there's, there's, there's something here that I think is so vitally important is that God talks about what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And in fact, I just went and underlined in my Bible several things. In fact, there's about 15 or 16 items here that, that, that really kind of focus in on this. It says, uh, I formed you, I knew you, I consecrated you, I appointed you. Going down to, uh, to verse 7, I send you, I command you, I, I, I am with you to deliver you. In verse 9, the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I have set you, over this, uh, set you this day over nations. Verse, uh, verse 12, I, I am watching over my word to perform it. You get down to verse 15, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north. Verse 16, I declare my judgments. Verse 17, I command you. Verse 18, I make you this day a fortified city. Verse 19, I am with you. Now, when I read this, I, I come to one logical conclusion. This is not Jeremiah's story. This is God's story that he has kind of invited Jeremiah to be part of. And that's one of the things that I think we have to understand. This is our bottom line here today. We don't invite God to partner in our mission. God invites us to partner with him for his mission. That's, that's a reality. But what we tend to do is we tend to say, this is what I want to do. Hey, God, you can come along if you want. And so it, it's not as though it's our story. God gets to play a bit part. It's his story. He's invited us to be part of the cast of millions in the story. But we all play a part. But here's the beautiful thing. As God has called us in, he wants us to own it. He wants us to own the part that we are to play. In fact, I want to just kind of dive into one verse here as we kind of close out. Verse 17. And in verse 17, there's actually four commands. But you, dress yourself for work. Arise. And say to them everything I commanded you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. So just notice a, a phrase here. You dress yourself for work, arise. Let's look at the dress yourself for work here. Dress yourself for work is, uh, I, I love this because this is actually the biblical command of, and you, if you've been in church for a while, you've maybe heard this term, gird up your loins. But gird up your loins, is, it, that's, a, that's a churchy term. But here's what they would do. They had the cloak, right? So they would take the back of their cloak and pull it forward and pull it up almost like a diaper and, and, and tuck it into their belt so that they could move swiftly. In other words, I'm going to say it this way. I'm going to say it in my redneck sort of way. Lace up your boots and roll up your sleeves. God's got work to do, and our ownership of this is getting dressed for work, wearing the right clothes. I mean, the, the full armor of God, all of this. He has called us to do this. But the next thing he says is arise. In fact, it's stand up is, is maybe a better way of saying this. In, in the Message Bible, it says up on your feet. And the New Living Translation says get up and go out. Stand up. And standing is part of the battle. Let me tell you what happened the other day. I, was, I have a problem sometimes with motivation. Anybody ever have a problem with motivation? I put my workout clothes on, and I was walking from the bedroom 
uh, down the hall. I, 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 I turned the corner and I was walking toward the living room and I was going to go out of, the, uh, out of the kitchen and go into the garage and get into the car and go to the gym. But I stopped in the living room and I sat down. And I stayed down. Started looking at stuff on my phone, different things. Sometimes standing up is, is part of the battle that we need to be ready to, to, to go. But notice the next thing uh, that is said here. Uh, he says this, say to them everything I command you. You see, God had called him as a prophet. And he said, my lane for you is to tell people about me. Here's the big thing. Here's the big thing. Carry out your mission faithfully. Carry out what I've asked you to do. I don't know what your lane is in the body of Christ. I know what the big picture is. Jesus said, tell people about me and help them follow me. And so we say that here as connect people to Jesus, help them discover his way of living. That's what we say here. I don't know what your lane is, but I know that whatever it is that you do, it is a critical role in, in, in the mission of God. So I'll say it like this. If it's holding babies in the nursery... Hold them babies. If it's loving the unlovable, love them with the love of Jesus. If it's giving generously, give with a grateful heart. If it's hosting a small group, if it's teaching kids, do that faithfully. If it's holding the door so that people can come into church, hold that door with great joy. I don't know what your lane is, but I know that whatever lane you have that God has placed you in is vital for his mission. And the final item is this, do not be dismayed. Do not be dismayed lest I dismay you before them. I want you to notice the very last thing that God says to Jeremiah in verse 19. The very last thing he says in verse 19, he says, For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. The very last thing that Jesus said in Matthew 28 before uh, leaving earth and going up into heaven, he gives us our marching orders. And after he gives us our marching orders, he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. The presence of God has been, pro has been promised to us through the Spirit living in in inside of us. We never have to be alone. We never have to do life alone. We don't have to walk alone. And there is the reality that God will never leave us and he will never forsake us. So in this world that's crazy, let us remember the words of God, I am with you. And the words that, uh, that, that in this world that is chaotic and, and spiraling out of control, let us remember God is saying, I am with you. In a world that's unpredictable and scary, God is saying, I am with you. When he calls you out of a comfort zone and you feel unprepared, when you, when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel like the mission is too big, understand that he is saying, I am with you. You know, one of the things as we think about death, we always talk about Psalm 23 during times of death, do we not? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, or you are with me. God doesn't say, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will meet you on the other side. No, I am with you. My rod and my staff, they comfort you. There's guide, there's protection as God is, is with us. In Psalm 46, it says, you know, even though the, the, the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, what? I can be still before the Lord. Why? Because I know he's God and I know he is with me. There's a promise of a path better than fear. That we can trust in the Lord because we know that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Will you join me in prayer? Father, you're good. And your presence in our life is perfect. May we recognize your presence. May we recognize your direction. May we recognize that no matter what we're walking through in life, you will never leave. 
that your promise, I am with you, began with servants of old and all the way through the Old Testament with Jesus saying, my spirit, I leave you. My spirit, I give you. Thank you. In Jesus' name.